The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked, don't you see that nothing can enter a person from the outside can defile them? for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule. Your Holy Spirit, our teacher. And your greater glory, our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I was preparing, I've, I've got a feeling I told some of you this quite recently, but it seems so apt that I'm going to tell you again about friends of mine in New Zealand who run a youth group. And one evening, this teenager came. She'd never been in the, in the youth group before, but she had on a, a T-shirt that had a very offensive logo. And uh, the youth leaders said they, they wanted to welcome her and encourage her, but they just thought she can't go around wearing that. And so one of them very nervously said, excuse me, you're going to have to cover that up. And she put some kind of sweater on, on top. And they wondered, would she be back? Well, the next week, she turned up, and they were so relieved. And one of them went up and said, I'm so sorry to, to have said that last week. I hope, I hope that was okay. And she said, oh, that's fine. That's fine. And here was a young woman who had a reputation for delighting to cross every moral boundary and to do it in the most shameless way possible. She liked to have that kind of reputation. She looked as if she didn't care. In fact, she rather enjoyed offending and, and horrifying people. But very privately, she said to that leader, you know, I don't want to be 
dirty. And here was this girl who behind the bravado was actually desperate for acceptance and affection, who wasn't comfortable in her own skin and felt dirty. Do you know that feeling? I think we all know that feeling, don't we? Sometimes it's because of a particular thing we've done. We thought, I don't believe I did that. We feel so tainted. Or it might be something from years ago that keeps coming back and hits our conscience, or something we've done yet again. Or just a general sense that there's something not right and that deeply damages relationships. It damages our relationships with one another because there's a sense that I mustn't let you see what I'm really like because if you might see what I'm really like, you might turn away in disgust, and so I cover up. And it affects not just our relationships with one another, but our relationship with God. And it might be you're here today, you're not even convinced there's a God. But throughout the world, pretty much every religion recognizes if there is a God, he, he's pure. And surely there must be some kind of problem, because if God is worth worshiping, there are things in my life that are not fit for the presence of a God who's worth worshiping. We, we feel again, we have to cover up and hide from him it's as old as humanity it's there in genesis chapter 3 where adam and eve after committing the first sin in the way that genesis 3 describes it immediately try and cover up they're ashamed they want to hide from one another they want to hide from god this sense of being dirty and being unclean is very human and i think we all identify with it and the question is how do we get clean is there a way of being cleansed so that we really feel we can be open with one another? We can be open with the living God. Here we have two sections. The, the longest section is all about the Pharisees. And we have two very different approaches to understanding how to be clean. The Pharisees, that's outward performance. And then we'll spend less time at the end that uh, woman who comes and approaches Jesus with such boldness, humble dependence. So first, outward performance. And these Pharisees, well, they get a bad press. We, we, even in normal speech, we say, oh, don't be such a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a hypocrite. But they wouldn't have thought of that back in those days. The Pharisee was very religious, very committed to the Bible and to following God to the letter of the law. And the result was that they followed a whole series of religious rules because they wanted to be clean. They wanted to stay clean. And so they looked at the Bible and they saw all sorts of laws about how to keep clean in the Bible. And then they added to them because they were so desperate to stay clean. And here they're horrified because they notice Jesus and the disciples and the disciples don't follow all those rules, all those washings of hands and utensils. And so they come to Jesus with a complaint. And this is not a complaint from the Department of Health. It's not about hygiene, getting germs, and so on. It's a religious complaint. It's about spiritual contamination. It all goes back to the Old Testament, and there's quite a lot of this stuff in the Old Testament. Prohibitions about things that you mustn't touch because then you'll be defiled, you'll be unclean, so you mustn't touch a dead body. And if you do, and obviously if you're burying someone close to you, you'll have to, well, th then you are spiritually contaminated because death is a result of sin. And so before entering the presence of God or approaching him in the temple, you needed all sorts of sacrifices to be offered and symbolic cleansing. Do with certain foods, and if you touched or ate certain foods, again, you'd be contaminated. All sorts of details about this. And the Pharisees took them very, very seriously and then added to them. Now, I think we get this, don't we? At last, she says, yes, and you've got a date. And you don't rush off the sports field and go as you are with mud all over and smelling horrible. I take it you have a have a shower, put on some clean clothes. Or you get that interview, and you're so excited because you really want the job. And again, you worry about your appearance. Am I clean and all scrubbed up? And if we worry about meeting that person or going to that interview, well, how much more? 
Should we make sure we're, as it were, all scrubbed up when we approach the living God? And these cleanliness laws in the Old Testament were all about it teaching an important lesson. You can't approach God without being clean. And the Pharisees got that. But here's where they were wrong. They were completely wrong in understanding what causes spiritual contamination, uncleanness, and they were completely wrong about how to deal with it. Their focus was all on these outward things, the rituals, the ceremonial washings, and they thought if they managed to avoid all, all those contaminations, eat the right food, not eat the wrong food, and if by some chance they got contaminated in those kind of ways, if they went through all the right rituals, then they'd be fine. They'd be clean. They thought they were clean. And they were horrified by these disciples who were lax in these matters. They placed their confidence in outward performance, following all these laws, making sure they have these external cleansings. And Jesus challenges them very strongly, actually. He says, in effect, it just leads to hypocrisy, this focus on outward performance. Verse 6 of Mark chapter 7. Isaiah, he says, was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus was full of love and kindness and compassion, but he spoke the truth, and he, he speaks a very hard truth. He saw their hearts. They were so focused on the externals, these detailed laws, that they failed to focus on what really matters. They looked outwardly clean to others, squeaky clean, but their hearts were not clean. Their religion was a sham. Their hearts were a long way from God. It was a big difference between what was going on outside and what was going on inside, and of course the reality is that's true for all of us. So, um, outwardly, I look great, don't I? Very easy to look, well, I hope I do. Um, it, it's, it's easy to look sort of reasonably godly when you're up front in church preaching a sermon. But there's inevitably a difference between all of us who do anything up front, outwardly and inwardly. It's true of all of us when we turn up at church. You look marvelous. You're lovely people. But my Bible tells me you're capable of the kind of things that I'm capable of in thinking and doing. Now, that's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, uh, I don't think, I, before preaching to you, I need to say, now, let, just, let me just tell you all the sins of the last week. I don't think that would be helpful for you or for me. It would draw the, the attention on me. When it's hypocritical, as if I'm claiming to be sinless, which I assure you I do not claim. And these people made such a show of their cleanliness and looked down on these disciples. They were unclean, and Jesus calls them out. You're honoring me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Mark Twain said once, everyone is a moon and has a dark side which they don't show to anybody. And so there's an element of cover-up going on right from the beginning of time. Well, fair enough. Don't, don't feel desperate about the fact there's a difference between the public self and the private, as long as there are some people who know what's really going on so they can encourage you and challenge you. But the hypocrisy is this claim of moral purity with no real attempt to deal with the heart. And Jesus points out the hypocrisy by showing what it leads to. It's seen in their response to the Word of God because Someone whose heart is genuinely open to God will listen very carefully to what God is saying in the Bible and seek to obey it. But they didn't have that approach to the Word of God. Verse 8, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions that added so much to the Bible and their focus was on obeying all these detailed regulations that they forgot what it was really all about, that listening to what God was saying and responding from the heart with faith and obedience. And he gives an example of what he means by that. Verse 10, Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. 
So the Bible says very clearly, you should respect your parents. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. It's a perfectly good tradition to declare certain things as dedicated to the Lord, but they use that tradition as a way of getting out of the word of God. And so by saying, oh, that's dedicated to the Lord, they didn't use that money to care for their parents, which was commanded by the God, but by the Lord God. Now, we so easily do it. I was listening this morning to, to Pete Wilkinson preaching on this passage. And he said it's very easy for those who are Bible-focused in our faith, sometimes called evangelicals. And we evangelicals can look at others who have all sorts of traditions and traditionalism in their in their church practice and think, oh, well, it's, it's, it's Roman Catholics who've got to be very, very careful that they add these traditions to the Word of God. But actually, we can do exactly the same. And Pete mentioned the quiet time. I think in my early days of the Christian life, I was so grateful to be encouraged to take time day by day to read the Bible and pray. Of course, it's a good thing. But the purpose of that is to help me hear the Word of God and obey it. But the danger was, I was so focused on ticking the box and doing that thing, I wouldn't always listen to actually what it was saying, and I'd feel my Christian life is going well if I'd had my few minutes of the day reading the Bible, and if I didn't do it, or I felt dirty and unclean, but that's not the point. Are you hearing it and obeying it? We too can nullify the Word of God when it comes to our parents. Think of the, the teenager who's constantly being nagged totally appropriately, by mum or by dad, clean your room. Clean your room. And there's a deadline. Six o'clock, I'm going to come and check, and I want you to clean your room. But you haven't done it. But you made a New Year's resolution, the beginning of September, you're going to try and read your Bible. And always, just before tea, you're going to read the Bible for 15 minutes, and you've got 15 minutes left. Oh, no, I've got to read the Bible. That's Bible reading time. I mustn't clean my room and her one teenager who was always reading their Bible when it was washing up time. <laughs> and that's not obeying the Lord. It's not obeying the Word of God. Or there's Granny, and she's lonely, and she'd love a visit. Oh, I'm too busy. Always too busy, because I'm committed to doing all that Christian work. I'm helping with that club. I'm, I'm going to that Bible study. I've got so many things going on that I can't actually care for my granny or uh, mum or dad they're getting old they need a carer coming in more regularly it's going to cost money but I've already we've already committed this proportion of our money to the church so we couldn't possibly give that money to the Lord that's tradition we get out of the word of God this focus on outward performance, it can so easily lead to hypocrisy. We can be so focused on ticking those boxes that we've set ourselves on that we're failing to focus on God and his word. It leads to hypocrisy. And more to the point, this is where Jesus goes on to say, it's hopeless. If you think you can somehow feel clean because you tick all those boxes, no, it's utterly hopeless. And by the way, I reckon most of us here in this room know our theology. We know that the way to be right with God is not by anything we do, but how easily we enter into a kind of way of thinking that how I'm right, how I'm, how I am with God is about whether I'm ticking all those boxes, those things that I've committed to doing, those things I'm expected to do. And so easily, if I'm ticking those boxes, you notice, oh, she always gets up early to read her Bible. He's always there at the prayer meeting. He, she's always there at impact. Oh, they're going great, but you know there could be a big difference between ticking all those boxes and what's really going on. As soon as we end up thinking, it somehow depends on what I do, it's utterly hopeless. You see, even if it was sincere trying to tick all those traditional boxes, it wouldn't deal with the problem because no outward performance can deal with the problem that isn't external, it 
deeply within, in the heart. And so Jesus gathers a crowd round. And he says, verse 15, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. It's a very straightforward point, isn't it? But the disciples just don't get it. And so he expands, verse 18, are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared, all foods clean. See what he's saying? How can what we eat make us dirty in the sight of God? Because it doesn't affect the real us. It goes in one end and out the other. It's fairly biological, sort of basic biology, isn't it? You know, that happens. And as it goes through, it doesn't touch the real us because the real us is in our hearts. In Mark comments, he thus declared all foods clean. We haven't got time to go into that now. But basically, his way of saying all those Old Testament rules about cleanliness and so on, they had their place. They were teaching a very important lesson that we need to be clean to approach the holy, clean God. But they were visual aids to a very important point that marked out the Jews as the people of God in Old Testament times, but now Jesus came to open up a way for all to be right with God. Those external markers of cleanliness no longer counted. And it's up to you, you're free, whether you follow those laws or not. Now the way to show that we're people of God now is by the Holy Spirit to live clean lives. And Jesus goes on, verse 20. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. You see, the problem is within. It's always said, but it's so true. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. It's a kind of default position for many today that we human beings are essentially good. And it's things that come from outside us that corrupt us, whether it's our upbringing, our education, our society. But I think deep down we know that's not true. Of course, those things can impact on us. But there's a problem deep within that affects every society throughout the history of the world. There was a naive belief in progress and the idea was especially in the, in the western world that uh, the more we understood in terms of reason education technology and so on the more progress we made and the better we'd come and then the first world war came and that was a shock to the system for those who believed in the inevitability of human progress and they just about recovered after the shock of the First World War, and then the Second World War came. I've just been in Berlin. And you see all over the place in Berlin the marks of the two horrors of fascism and then communism. But it's not unique to fascism and communism. The, the horrors of the 20th and 21st century are seen in every society. Lord David Cecil, formerly professor of English literature here in this university, speaking after the Second World War, the jargon of the philosophy of progress taught us to think that the savage and primitive state of humanity is behind us. It's not behind us. It's within us. It's in every society. You look at those, that list, you won't find every one of them seen in every person to the fullest degree, certainly not, but you'll see them all in every society. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, been said there are only two species that kill their own kind in large numbers rats and human beings and you see these things in every society you'll see them in every individual to a certain degree sexual immorality theft never stolen anything murder jesus said to to, to think angry thoughts about someone it's a murderous thought adultery not committed adultery jesus said anyone who looks at another person with lust in their heart 
That's not a marriage, that's adultery, and so it goes on. It's hard to deny these truths. And Jesus is saying no outward performance can make us clean, individually or societally. People naively think, if we only sort out the education system, the political system, if we only bring democracy in, you see what's happened to that in the last few decades. It doesn't change the human heart. So what hope is there? Feel the clean people. And let's not be too down on the Pharisees. There was a zeal there. But even those who in that society were known as the most clean, even they are dirty. What hope is there? What hope is there for me? Well, that's why I love the fact that Mark includes, straight after this, this lovely account of the meeting of Jesus with this woman from Syrah, Phoenicia. Jesus has moved on now. And he's in a Gentile region. And a woman, Gentile, comes up towards him. The kind of person that these Pharisees would have kept their distance from because to have any kind of public connection with a woman that they're not married to, that would have been contaminating spiritually. Certainly, to be close to a Gentile and communicate in that kind of way, that was spiritually contaminating. They would avoid Gentile territory, so they weren't spiritually contaminated. And do notice, this woman has a daughter with an impure spirit, somehow taken over by an evil spirit. She's unclean. But she hears that Jesus is nearby. And beautifully, we read, verse 26, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. She's not got any claim on him. She's got no outward performance to offer. She just begs. And Jesus says these shocking words. Verse 27, first, let the children eat all they want. For it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. What do you make of that? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild sound very gentle, meek or mild. It sounds very offensive to us and it's true that Jews often called Gentiles dogs because they were unclean. What's going on here? I'm sure Jesus isn't being gratuitously offensive. He's not causing offense for the sake of it. But he's making a point. He, he talks about the order in which you've feed people. So imagine, in fact, the, the word he uses for, for dog is, is, is not the kind of rabid kind of animal or normal word that would be used of kind of dogs, but of a, of a family dog, a pet, you might say, or even a puppy. That's the kind of language he uses. And he's talking about a household scene. And of course, you love your dogs, but you give priority around the table to the children. They get fed first. And what Jesus is doing, and the parallel passage in the other Gospels make it very clear, Jesus was quite clear that his focus when he came to earth was the Jews. He said, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And only then, once he'd taught the Jews and then died on the cross and raised, then he'd send his disciples, as he does, to the Gentiles, to all nations. But he came first to the people who'd been prepared for him for generations. So he's saying to this Gentile woman, look, this is not the time. I'm, I'm here to, to, to feed the Jews first, first, that's what he says, first let the children eat all they want. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Well, you'd understand if the woman would turn away feeling, well, this is hopeless. I was longing for something, but I've been knocked back and she just slinks away. But she doesn't take offense, strikingly. She doesn't say, how dare you speak in that kind of language to me? And beautifully, nor does she give up. Parents, you know very well that when there's something wrong with a kid, and you'd do anything. And even people who are normally pretty mild and don't push to the front of the queue, when there's something wrong with your kid, you, you're pushed to the front of the queue. And here's this woman who really cares. She loves her daughter. She's desperate. And this man can help. And so she doesn't give up. And she says, verse 28, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Isn't it beautiful? Humble defendants. I don't deserve it. 
Nothing here about rights. I deserve nothing. But just give us a crown, would you? And Jesus responds to her completely differently to the way he'd responded to the Pharisees. For such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Well, I hope you find that encouraging. So there are two reasons why we might hold back from approaching Jesus Christ for mercy. One might be because we don't think we need it. And it may just be that there's someone here this evening thinking, well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm clean. And the Pharisees didn't think they needed Jesus. They thought they were fine as they are. They were relying on their outward performance. All those rituals that they followed, of course God loved them. So they never came to Jesus humbly. And if you think, yeah, I don't need Jesus, just ask you to think, is there really no difference between the outside and the inside? Because Jesus sees both. But there's another reason why people don't receive mercy from Jesus and they think, well, I'm just too dirty. There's no point in approaching him. He just pushed me away because he knows what I'm really like and it may be that you're like that. And perhaps you've, you've said sorry before, you've done it again. And you think, I can't keep saying sorry. Or you're thinking to yourself, if, if you knew what I was really like and the kind of things I've done, you'd know God could never have any time with me. And that's just the point. No one will be turned away if they come with humble dependence. And if you've been to a Lord's Supper here at St. Ebbs, you'll know that we use the old words of Thomas Cranmer, preparing to receive the bread and the wine. Do you remember these words? We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. And Cranmer, I'm sure, had this passage in mind. He goes on, we are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy, not outward performance, but humble dependence. Is that your conviction? Do you know that to be true? I think many of us do. We know in our conviction, it's not about what I do, it's about what Jesus has done, and I depend on mercy. That's your conviction. That's the place to start. It's really not the place to end. Is that your conviction? Well, the next, is it your spirituality? In other words, is it how you engage with God? You know it in your head. But how easily in our heads we know it all depends on Jesus and his mercy. And yet we're still judging the quality of our Christian lives by how many of those boxes we tick. And we feel rather good about ourselves. I've done all those things. Or we feel terrible about ourselves. Or I've not ticked all those boxes this week. And that way is disaster. Is this approach of humble dependence our conviction, our spirituality, and our culture? Oh, that's so important. And how easy it is to have a church with all sorts of convictions that are not lived out in culture. And this is our culture. And not literally, of course. Our masks will be off as far as our relationships with one another will be concerned because I'm not going to be worried too much that you realize I haven't ticked all those boxes because we take it as a given. None of us deserve anything from God. I was so encouraged to hear Johnny saying that in, in, in the group there was an ability to be able to be open with each other. And I hope we can be open because we've got to be open with God and say, actually, I'm, I'm not doing well in this area or that area. I've blown it. I haven't ticked all those boxes but I need your help as together we come, not on the basis of outward performance, but of humble dependence to the merciful God. Let's pray. Lord, we don't deserve to approach you in and of ourselves in anything we've done. We, we're not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you're the Lord who is rich in mercy. And so we pray for anyone who's never come in humble dependence to you. Please draw them to yourself. And may they receive 
forgiveness through Christ. And for the rest of us who know these things, help us not only to believe them in our heads, but to relate to you on the basis of your grace. And to relate to one another in the same way. For Jesus' sake. Amen.